Hello there, Rain World Nation. I haven't uploaded a Rain World video in like half a year, and I want to fix that. So let's do some random ranking stuff, because The Watcher is probably going to be announced in a few days, and I don't know what else to do right now. I have no other video ideas. But, well, I do have a correction to make. In my original region tier list, I left out a region kind of on purpose, but kind of accidentally, and since then, it's been nagging at me, and I just want to correct it for the record right now. So, there are 62 regions and subregions eligible for the region tier list now. 62 is still Vents from Looks to the Moon because it still sucks. I hate it. I will never go back to it. And then 61 is not the gutter because, uh, you know how the precipice exists in Shoreline too, technically? Why does it exist in Shoreline? Why is it there? Why is it accessible? Every time I watch someone play the game for the first time, and they get to the underhang, and they get to that shelter, they see the gate to the precipice, they go through it because it's free, and they spend like half an hour being really confused, and doing absolutely nothing, and getting annoyed, because there's literally nothing to do there. It exists as an easter egg for people who have already played the game before, I get that. It exists as an easter egg for people who have played through Artificer's pre-matches campaign, and been through the precipice, and now know that it's there, but does it really add enough to justify that? I, I don't think so, no, it doesn't. It's just, it's just really confusing for new players, and there's nothing to it besides, like, one lizard and one drop wig that sometimes show up. There's no gameplay element, there's no real story reason for it. You could just have the gate there be collapsed like the gates in Saints are. It wouldn't really affect anything. I don't know why it's here. It shouldn't be. I shouldn't have to be re-ranking it because it shouldn't be there. But it's not worse than Vents because <laughs> screw that place. Oh my god. Okay, so that, that's off my chest now. I'm doing all this unscripted, by the way, so this is going to be a mess and you're going to deal with it. Now, uh, people have actually been asking me for this one. Uh, Slugcat tier list. Slugcat tier list. Might as well. Why not? Let us make our tier list that's going to be out of date in approximately three days from now. I am recording this on the 16th of September. September. So, I'm gonna be ranking the Slugcats just fairly loosely. I've kind of thought about it a little bit before, but I kind of haven't. I kind of know what my number one is. You know what my number one is. If you don't know what my number one is, you haven't watched any of my videos before. But, uh, beyond that, no, yeah, I'm just gonna wing it. And it's gonna be kind of based on both how the Slugcat plays, how their campaign is, what their story is, what their regions are like. It's just all of that. How the overall vibe check of a Slugcat is what we're gonna call it. And and you know what? I, it's, it's just not very surprising, but what Slugcat has the worst vibes? Well, it's the one they almost didn't add. It is Spearmaster. I like, people say Spearmaster is better hunter. I do not see it. I would always rather have a spear, a back spear, and a rock versus two spears and not be able to carry anything in my stomach. I don't want this arcane method of having to spear enemies to feed at all and getting less food for it than you would. You have to kill so many things as Spearmaster just to stay alive. Someone else, I think Daz brought it up in one of his videos, but blue lizards are like six food for Hunter and they're one food for Spearmaster. The ratio is just whack. And it doesn't help that Spearmaster was almost not going to happen and then it did happen and you can kind of tell because uh, the past garbage waste region, which is pretty fine as Artificer, I like it a lot, it makes sense for Artificer, but Spearmaster has so much trouble there. Like, Spearmaster cannot do the really tricky platforming. Spearmaster's platforming is no better than like Hunter's is. There, it's basically just alternate universe Hunter where instead of uh, the time limit quest, you have your own quest to go to Pebbles, not know what's happening because uh, you don't get the mark of communication. I actually did. I actually went to Moon first and then I went through the precipice and then I passaged back to Moon and then I passaged back to Pebbles and I just took the Pearl to Sky Island from there and it was, you know, a campaign that happened. Uh, but like, it's not terrible. Spearmaster's not awful. I don't hate hate Spearmaster, but I don't like Spearmaster. It's the campaign I'm least likely to revisit because everything it adds, I don't like. The Looks of the Moon subregion is cool. I like that it's there, but I like that it's 
there more because it gives context to Submerged Superstructure. And even then, I, su I visited Submerged Superstructure before. I visited Lux to the Moon and Scream Master's campaign, so it was kind of like reverse of what happens between Five Pebbles and uh, uh, Silent Construct, so it's not that cool. Like, I didn't have the region that high on my overall region ranking, mostly because the exterior sections of that region, I think, are kind of trash, but Spear Master overall has a nice story. I do like Spear Master's story. I like I like getting the communications, even if it doesn't mean anything to Spear Master itself, and I like how Spear Master is kind of just like this cosmic punching bag that the world hates for some reason. You shouldn't be alive, foul creature, but I want to hug you anyways. And Spear Master's purple. Purple is uh, the best color. There's not an argument to be had. I'm not I'm not the Benny on this, so that's that's what Spear Master is. Spear Master is kind of bad, but I don't hate it. Next up, uh, I probably will be upsetting some people with this one, but mm, Chunky Boy. Chunky Boy. It's honestly, it just comes down to one thing with Chunky Boy. I don't like stamina mechanics. I don't like stamina mechanics, and it just there's no point where I'd rather be playing as Gourmand over any other slug cat because of the stamina mechanic. I would rather play as Spearmaster as a slug cat than as Gourmand. I just think Spearmaster has the weakest campaign of the bunch by far. Uh, Gourmand's campaign is basically just, I get what they're doing with it. It's a, hey, welcome back to longtime players who have played the game in the past but haven't played it in a bit and Downpour just got released and it's the first campaign of Downpour. It's like, hey, here's something to kind of easy win, get you to explore the entire map with the food quest again. We're going to make the spawns harder than Survivor but not as hard as Hunter's, not as hard as like the later slug cats. It's kind of like if Survivor is normal difficulty and Hunter is expert difficulty, then Gourmand is hard difficulty, you know? It's like not the hardest thing in the world, but it's not gonna baby you either. And Outer Expanse is, is awesome. You get to go to Five Pebbles, he calls you fat, that's very funny. Uh, but then, but then Gourmand itself is like, okay, you got a stamina meter, that sucks. You're pretty heavy, you could Gooba stop enemies, that's pretty fun. You can roll for miles, that's cool, I guess. There's a whole crafting system that I, you, you could interact with it if you want. It's kind of dependent on finding the items you want, but like, it's cool that it's there, I guess. Like, nothing that Gourmand has makes up for the fact that it's tied to a stamina meter. And even Outer Expanse, which is cool, yes, but you can also visit it as a survivor and monk, and it's more fun when you do. I just, I don't have a reason to play Gourmand. I don't dislike Gourmand at all. He is totally fine. Gourmand is fine. I have nothing against Gourmand, but I will never choose to play him. Uh, what's up next, huh? That's actually hard. This might be, uh, normally you'd put Monk here, uh, but I have bias towards Monk for reasons I'll get into later. Uh, there's an obvious top three to me, uh, I think, but, and eh, you know what? Uh, sure, Hunter. Hunter might as well be next. The thing about Hunter is, I think, as a slug cat to play, Hunter is my favorite. I like, uh, being slightly stronger than Survivor, slightly faster than Survivor. I like the back spear a lot. It is the best expedition perk. Do not fight me on this. That is the best one. I just like always having access to an extra spear. It's great. And then Hunter has a tragic story, which I like. That's also very tied to itself rather than like uh, tied to the iterators or the world. It's kind of like it is a messenger in the same way the Spearmaster is. But Hunter actually has the whole story of like having the rot and having to ascend within 20 cycles before. Uh, it just turns into Hunter Longlegs. And that's cool, and it's also on a time limit, and you could lose, and that's very stressful, and I don't like it that much, but I get it. It is an interesting challenge. It is different from all the other campaigns. It's the OG expert mode. It's probably still the hardest campaign just because of that time limit, and there's really not much else to say about Hunter because it's kind of just a harder survivor with harder spawns in a harder world. It's otherwise exactly the same. Like, that's what basically Marine World was. Okay, I can't let my bias carry this uh, boy too much further though. Yeah, Monk's gotta be next. Like, Monk is good. Monk is a nice, easier mode. It's like, if you don't like dealing with the karma system as much, Monk is your boy. He's got lower food requirements. He's got, you know, I think it's like creatures don't notice him as easily and it's way easier to make friends with lizards and scavengers. And in the base game, uh, Monk had less breath for some reason, which kind of sucked, but uh, you could toggle that in downpour, so it's not really a big issue anymore. And then uh, other than that, Monk is survivor but easier and i played monk probably the most out of every slug cat because uh my pearl and arena unlock run 
was on the monk file because it was just easiest that way. Monk is what I used to explore some more superstructure for the first time, and that's my favorite region, so I have affection for monk for that. It is a completely biased pick to put him this high, and I am not going to apologize. Now then, uh, what's next? What's next is, um, uh, yeah, this has to be Artificer, I think. I like Artificer a lot. I think movement-wise, Artificer is really fun. I don't think uh, crafting uh, explosives, no, not, not explosives, crafting bombs is not all that useful because I don't ever really want to kill things with bombs because it usually just sends them flying off the side of a pit and I killed you because I want to eat you, but whatever. Explosive spears are kind of useful though. And then Artie's got, you know, Artie's got the hard mode world, the hard mode world that's like the past version that I actually like versus Spearmaster who doesn't really get anything because like, like I said, past garbage waste, the precipice, you could tell those were made with Artificer in mind. Artie has has a pretty pleasant time there where Spearmaster kind of just dies infinitely. And like, finding scavs is rough, sure, but it gives the campaign flavor, I think. It's interesting, Artie is actually pretty well equipped to fight scavs. I guess a group of scavs is the one place you want to use a bomb just to kill them all before they get to you, so fair enough there. And then being able to double jump all around is fun. Not being able to swim kind of sucks. Artie has probably the shortest campaign of all the downforce slug cats if you just go for the normal ending, because you just beeline at the pebbles, go to Metropolis, go through Metropolis, kill the about the king scab and you're done. It's just not much of anything, but it's not not good. But I actually really like our uh, Artificer's other route where in theory, what you're supposed to do, and I've actually watched someone do this, is that you go to Metropolis, you find the echo there and you realize, oh wait, Artificer can get echoes. And the echo's like, hey, what you're doing right now is stop doing that. And you can like go, um, I'm not gonna stop doing this. Or you go, hmm, okay, I will go stop doing this and I will go try to ascend now that I know that I actually can gain Karba. And so that I think it's a much more interesting campaign that way, even if it's probably not the canon one. Cause it's like, it's a harder version of what Hunter has to do. Cause you have to keep your Karma flower for the earlier echoes, but you also don't have the time limit. So it's not as stressful. I just like it. I, I, I went back and did it like quite a bit after I'd finished the rest of the game. And I just had a pretty good tie with it. Even with the scavs, even with the harder spawns, it's, it's an interesting challenge and the ending makes me cry. So, you know, there's that too. I think if I were a slug cat, I would be artificer because I can't artifice her. Uh, you can't stop me from doing that. Okay, and then, you know what? I was I was thinking I was gonna put Survivor next, but no, actually, I'm gonna put Rivulet next. I like Rivulet a lot because Rivulet is fast and can swim a lot, and I like swimming, which I forgot to mention for Artificer, but yeah, that's another downside of Artificer is that Artificer can't swim at all. Artificer explodes after like two seconds underwater and it's kind of silly. I don't know why that was added. I don't, there's no real reason for it, but whatever, I don't care. Artifice doesn't need to go into any regions with water anyway, so whatever. Rivulet is really good in a lot of ways. The campaign is cool where it's a test of your map knowledge. Like if Artificer and Spearmaster are testing your combat uh, capabilities, kind of also platforming for Artificer, but Rivulet is testing your map knowledge. Like you need to know where you're going in Rivulet's campaign. You can't just blindly stumble about and survive because you do not have enough time to explore. Rivulet is very fast. Rivulet can beeline it from shelter to shelter, pick up food along the way, and that's basically the entire first half of the campaign. Except then you rip out Pebbles' heart and now the campaign is just normal. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? Like, for lore reasons, it makes sense. And for the fact that you want players to go to submerged sewer structure, you want them to be able to explore this new region they've likely never explored before, I get it. But it kind of defeats the whole point of Rivulet's campaign. Like, you took out the one thing that made the campaign cool and replaced it with the gravity ball, which is cool, I guess. And I love Superbird superstructure. I love exploring it. I love Bitter Airy. I love the ending. I don't care that it's like five minutes of text. It's a cool ending. Shut up. But I just don't think that that makes the campaign interesting. Cause like, yep, the campaign's basically over about halfway through. And then, so this is going to sound really, really annoying. This is the other reason why I have Rivulet this low. Who is Rivulet? What is Rivulet doing here? Why do I care about Rivulet? Every other slug cat, I understand who they are, what they want, and what they're doing. Spearmaster is a messenger who's like a genetic abomination and life is suffering and it's doing its job. It's just getting through the workday. Just 
Gotta go another day. Gourmand is, loves food, is like the scout for the Pebbles facility. Goes in, gets food, eats food, leaves, returns home to its tribe, tells them, hey, don't go in there. There's a really angry computer here. You should probably go somewhere else. Hunter's got, you know, it's, I'm literally dying thing going on. Monk is just after his uh, sibling. Survivor is just average Joe. Survivor is your uh, blue collar worker, yeah. Fear Master is the white collar worker. Uh, Survivor is blue collar. Artificer is, you know, you killed my family, prepare to die. Saint is on a mystic journey throughout the world to achieve enlightenment and all that. Reveal is just there. Reveal is just sitting around, shows up one day, solves everyone's problems, and then dies, I guess, eventually after spending like 20 years or something of Moon, who knows. And we don't really know anything about it, and that's fine. Like, you don't have to explain it, but it makes Reveal less interesting as a character to me. And I, this is, is like a really annoying complaint I know, but it's just how I feel. And then next up, uh, you know it has to be Survivor. See, the thing is about Survivor is it is the Rain World experience. Rain World is two video games. There's the Rain World where you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where you are, and you have to learn all the rules, and that is Survivor's campaign, or Monk's campaign if you're playing on Monk first. And then there's the Rain World where you know what you're doing, and the challenge is more achieving goals than it is exploring and finding new places. Like, all the Downport Slowcasts get a little bit of that because they have their own new regions, but that's what all the entirety of Survivor's campaign is. It is learning how to be a Slugcast. Exploring the world, which is a cool world. I like pretty much all the base game regions a lot, except for farm arrays, which is just kind of lame, kind of annoying, and it's rough at first. The first time I played Rain World, I was on Survivor, and I hated it, but it was mostly because of the karma system, let's be real. I, I stand by that criticism. I do not like the karma system. I never will. You're not going to change my mind on that, but other than that, like, if you like Rain World, you like Survivor a lot. It's the one that establishes everything. It was originally only in the campaign in the game. It's just got everything that makes Rain World good. I don't really have anything to criticize about Survivor in particular that I wouldn't criticize about other slug cats and it's just like the most experience of them all except for uh you know the one that i made a whole 52 minute video about i'm not even gonna explain this one you don't you don't need an explanation for me you know why saint is at the top of this list and if you don't know and you want to know just go watch the video i made that's that is the answer to your question we are done here i am not explaining myself further good day sir all right, and the other tier list I wanted to do, honestly, the most important tier list anyone can ever do for Rain World, the Lizard tier list. Again, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be like explicitly ranting in these ones. I'm just gonna put them in tiers, and I'm probably just gonna go in order. So, uh, starting out, uh, we have the Green Lizard, which is S tier. The Green Lizard makes me want to start a religion. Like, you see the Green Lizard, just this chill dude laying around doing nothing all day, dragging its fat butt with its big fat legs, and it is just completely unbothered by the world. Vulture shows up, okay. Every other lizard, every other prey creature inside is gonna scurry away, but the, 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 the green lizard doesn't care. The green lizard's just gonna sit there and just have a good time. Wormgrass, you know, just every other creature gets freaking swallowed up by it. The wormgrass is not gonna touch the green lizard. It's just gonna just walk right through it. The green lizard just simply does not care. It is living its best life, and we should all aspire to be like it. We should all aspire to be as zen as the green lizard. Thank you for coming to my service good day. All right, that's that's the important one. The best lizard, for sure. Except, uh, is it, though? Because, you know, the pink lizard's also pretty good, too, right? Just your average Joe of lizards, but, you know, a little bit better than that implies, because, like, the pink lizard, nothing special about them. They're the most normal lizard, but they can really sneak up on you, you know? They have really good reflexes, right? People will interact with green lizards, and, like, they're slow and clumsy and etc. The pink lizard is not messing around, though. If you try to jump over that pink lizard, it's gonna snap you up and kill you. It's gonna drag you back to its den, it's gonna have a delicious dinner, it's gonna have a really good day. Just doing its job, not doing an exceptional job, but, you you know, doing this job, clock it in the hours, uh, but it can surprise you if you're not looking out for it. So that's a, that's why the pink lizard is S tier. But, you know, the blue lizard's pretty awesome too, right? Like, the blue lizard's kinda, you know, the butt monkey of the lizard family. It's a little sky, well, little until uh, strawberry lizard, but we'll get to that later. But also, kinda really sa talented, you know? Like, tries his hardest, really wants to impress you. Like, climbing on walls, stealing uh, your spear with its tongue, it'll literally, like, try to body slam you from the wall. It's walking 
walking on, like, try to land on you and bite you, because it's like, no, I'm, I'm a real go-getter. I am going to get you. I am gonna get you. I am gonna get you. Me when I heck and get you. And it's just, like, cute, you know? All the lizards are really cute, but the blue lizards are especially cute, I think. They're just little guys. They're just little guys. They're blue. da ba dee da ba die I like them. Okay, if you go in order, what's next? I guess the white lizard is next. Uh, the white lizard is also S tier, by the way. The white lizard is just here to have a party, you know? It's like it's like a wallflower. It lurks in the corner of the party, but you, you get its attention, and it'll start, you know, flashing all these pretty colors and having a good time. But otherwise, it's kind of just content to just chill and just bask in the ambience of it all. But also, you know, sneaky little guy. Sneaky little hunter. Probably the most dangerous lizard, I'm gonna be real. <laughs> like, I don't think I'm more afraid of any other lizard besides, I guess, the red lizard than I am the white lizard, because you never know where he is. You never know. You could, he could always be there, and you would never know. Just here to have a good time is also, like, you know, really sneaky, really cool. We love the white lizard here. And then, uh, let's just go through the original, uh, Dragon Slayer lizard. So, the orange lizard, which is also S tier. Uh, you know, the orange lizard? just wants to be your friend. The orange lizard just wants to have as many friends as possible. Every other lizard will fight with each other, not the orange lizard. The orange lizard is not gonna fight another orange lizard. They are friends. They will hug and kiss and cuddle all day long if you leave them to their own business. But they also work great as a team. They're a real team player. They're really good at communication. They're really good at cooperation. They're not really any more individually talented than the pink lizard, but they work together to become something more. Their friends are their power. They are the Kingdom Hearts lizard. That's what we're here for. The Kingdom Hearts lizard, baby. Also, they have the cute little antenna, and I just love that. They're just so cute. They're so cute, right? They're so cute. Ah, uh, okay. And then our other team player-ish, uh, the mole lizard, the black lizard, the lizard sun's eyes. There's a real introvert lizard. Like, they hang out in dark places all day. They don't really like each other particularly much, but they don't mind each other. They are they are fine existing within each other, and they have really keen senses to make up for their lack of eyesight. Like, they are really in tune with the world. They know their way around filtration system, which is better than I can say. They blend in real well. You can barely see them unless their heads are flashing. They're a little on the ugly cute side, you know, because they got those weird whiskers. They don't have eyes. They're, they're different lizards, but they're still cute, you know? I think I think they're cute. And now, arguably a lizard because they're not considered one for the dragon slayer, but I don't care. Uh, the salamanders. They're just so cute. Look at this little guy. Look at that little guy. Look, look at that. Look at that little guy. He's just so cute. He's really good at swimming. I like swimming. He's talented. So cute. He's just a really cute guy. And uh, the salamander's distant cousin, the eel. Kind of like the diet salamander, but also the eel lizard is really reliable, you know? Like, it doesn't excel at one thing like the salamander does. It's kind of a jack of all trades, because, you know, it can climb poles, it can climb walls. But that's just really versatile, you know? It is like the only lizard where you can tame it, and it can follow you pretty much anywhere. It can follow you underwater, it can follow you across most platforms, it can follow you, like, through buildings. Like, most other lizards get stuck by one or the other of those. I think the only other lizard who's, like, really reliable as a tame lizard is the cyan lizard and even then the cyan lizards can't swim so i think the yellow lizards are probably the most reliable in that aspect and they're just a lovely teal color like they're more green than teal but they're like a little nicer bluer than the green lizard which is not a bad thing but green is kind of an uncreative color you know just make it a little bit tealer and that's that's all i ask for you and i guess we'll finish off the last base game lizard now because like might as well the cyan lizard is probably my other favorite lizard of the entire bunch along with the orange lizard because it's just so cute like they look so different from all the other lizards but they're also really Really cute, you know? They're just really pretty. I want to hug one. I want to hug that lizard. I want to hug that lizard real bad. I want to be friends with that lizard. Also, it's really talented, you know? They can jump. They got the big jumps. They got the big jumps. They make the most mistakes out of any other lizard, which is really cute as well. Like, they're clumsy little guys, and they're also really dangerous, too, you know? Because, like, they can get you. They can hack and get you. The lizard's gonna hack and get you, but the silent lizard's gonna hack and get you. And there's nothing you can do about it, really, unless you're, like, a good shot, you know? I think they're really neat. All right, down to three more lizards. Uh, uh, the caramel lizard. Uh, caramel lizard is like halfway between a green lizard and a red lizard. Like, it's got the bulk of a green lizard, but it's got the spit of the red lizard, and it's also got like big yumps, but like really goofy yumps, like just launching itself forward. The caramel lizard is kind of stupid, but at the same time, it's like, I don't trust caramel lizards because whenever I'm in a room with one, I don't know what it's going to do. Sometimes they'll just sit around doing nothing all day. Sometimes they'll just park their fat butts and not do anything, completely ignore me, 
except for spitting at me because they don't really care that much. And then sometimes they're like faster than red lizards, I swear to God. Like those things can really move if they want to. They are strange ones, but I think that makes them interesting, you know? Also, if I were caramel flavored, I think that'd be just neat. I, I would like to be caramel flavored, I think. Caramel is delicious. You know what else is delicious? Strawberries. Oh, the strawberry lizard, the other butt monkey of the lizard world. Even more so than the blue lizards, because I think even blue lizards will hunt strawberry lizards if I'm not correct. Maybe I'm wrong about that one. The strawberry lizard is so small that it has to hunt bat flies, which is really cute. Like, oh no, all the other lizards are so big and mean and they bully me. I'm just gonna go back to eating bugs, whatever. I mean, they can hunt slug cat too, because every lizard can hunt slug cats because slug cats are delicious, everyone knows that. The strawberry lizard is also like, you know, really niche. Like it only shows up in Saints campaign naturally, though I think I saw my first one in Artificer's campaign actually, like I accidentally lineaged one, which was pretty neat. But they're, they're mostly in Saints campaign. They have got the neat tongues. They like, every downpour slug cat kind of has like its own parallel lizard. For Saint, it's the strawberry lizard. Uh, for Artificer, it's the cyan lizard. For Gourmand, it's the caramel lizard. Uh, for Rivulet, it's, uh, I guess the eel or the salamander, both of them kind of. Uh, Spearmaster is the only one where there's not really any parallel. Honestly, I guess you could argue the train lizard, but the train lizard isn't real, so we don't talk about that one. But yeah, the strawberry lizard is cool. And then, uh, of course, saving the best for last, except I, I don't think it's the best lizard, but it's it's still S tier, because, you know, every lizard's perfect. The red lizard is a menace. The red lizard is just the winner. It's the one that wins. The red lizard wins, unless it's fighting a green lizard, because, you know, for some reason, the green lizard is so zen that it's just immune to red lizard bites. I, I love that about the green lizard. I'm, I'm still worshiping the green lizard. Come to my cult. But the red lizard is otherwise, you know, it will kill you, and it will be very painful. And it's as it's simple as that. That's why the red lizard's awesome. Thank you for watching my video. Good night.